I'd like to have all the elders and the deacons to come to the stage, please. Now. <laughs> now. <laughs> all elders and deacons to come to the stage. I want the whole world and the brotherhood to see how much we love our minister. There's no division among this leadership. This leadership is together. This is our man of God. We stand with him 100%. 100%. We might not agree on everything. We might not agree on everything, but we love our minister. Come on, let's give it to him. Let's give it to him. We love our minister. You don't mess with our minister. I want to thank all of and all the committees, the, the medical team and all the committees that I mentioned today. I want you to give them a standing ovation for all the work that your brothers and sisters have done. Give them, let's give it to them. Let's give it to them. Let's give it to them. The devil is not going to mess with Renaissance. We got some for you, devil. We got love. We got honor and respect for our minister. This is our minister. Our minister. God, we love him. We love him. All right. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know he was going to do that. Um, William's from the street, and uh, there's really no telling what he'll say when he feels it. Uh, you, uh, you heard his very aggressive come up here now, you know, that's, you know, and you know, he, you know, if you push him too hard, he'll say words not in the Bible. And it's my, it's my pastor. I appreciate it. I thank all these guys for coming up and I appreciate that. Uh, in my behavior, I wish I had two or three people that can admit right now that sometimes it's my, it's the love Christ has for me that's the why behind what I do. Sometimes I don't feel like doing it. Sometimes I don't wake up and want to do it. Sometimes you get on my last nerve and I don't want to do it. There are folk that say things that drive you crazy, but the thing that keeps you under control and what keeps you going forward and what keeps you doing the right thing is that there was somebody in the city of Jerusalem that died on Calvary's cross that hung high and stretched wide and when I think about the love that he has for me that love controls me that love constricts me that love guides me and every thought down and then I need I need something outside of me to control me. I need, I need something to, when I'm about to act out, I need something. When somebody assassinating your character, you need, because sometimes my false impulse is to react in a vengeful spirit and Sometimes they give you back what you've given me, but I'm glad I got a God who will. Oh God, I wish I had a church. I, I'm glad I got a God that every now and then I got to look at the cross and, and remind myself if I look at you too long, I ain't going to do the right thing. And if, and if I base everything I'm going to do on you, then I might go the wrong way. But when I look at Jesus and, and I look at how he died for my sin and I, and I watch how nails were pushed through the soft flesh of his hands and I watch how he died in my place. Then when I look at you, the love of Christ constricts me from I'm doing what I have no business doing. Can anybody testify that every now and then God had to tie you up? I, that's why I wish I had a rope up here. I will show you. I wish I, uh, you know, praise God, do I have one? Do I, oh, I got a rope. Well, come here then, Dan. Praise God. Yeah, I didn't know I had a rope. Praise God. Mm. Oh, God, I wish I had two or three witnesses that can testify. Uh, uh, why don't you come up here, Connor? I praise God because every now and then I don't feel like I'm going to do the right thing and, and I don't feel like 
I'm going to do the right thing. And sometimes I find myself at a space where people will provoke you and they know how to get under your skin and they, they know how to poke at you and they, they know how to make you feel a certain kind of way. And sometimes you just want to get up and, and, and you want to tell somebody what's really on your mind. Have you ever been in that space where you want to really tell somebody how you feel about what it is? And, and praise God, have you ever had some folk that you felt like the best way to deal with them is to be honest? about what you was thinking and every now and then there are folk that are poke at you but man when I'm about to do something crazy then the love of Christ will stop me from doing what I really would like to do sometimes I gotta get constricted I'm glad the Holy Spirit knows how to keep me in place when I'm about to do something I have no business doing have you ever been about to do something but it was God that kept you tied up where you are I wish I had two or three witnesses that when I want to get out of my seat and when I want to do something I got no business doing the love of Christ it constrains me have you uh, have you been there when you want to leave but you can't have you ever been there when you want to say something but you can't have you been there when you wanted to leave the marriage but you can't have you been there when you wanted to cuss but you can't have you been there this there's somebody that's a witness that sometimes he constrains me um, listen church I've I've been in that space when when I'm trying to when I'm when God let me and He says I can't let you. Paul said they talking about my apostleship and I really want to tell him something else. But he said God said no 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 no. No, no, no. I'm going to let this love constrain you. I want you to look at the cross. If I had time, I would show you that Paul had to look past people and see cross. Sometimes you got to look past people and and see the cross because folk don't know your pain and they don't know your agony. I mean, Paul, Paul was in the ministry where he had been stoned and Paul was in a ministry where he had been ridiculed and Paul was in a ministry where folk was skeptical about him, but he kept on preaching anyway. He was in a ministry where he did three consecutive missionary journeys, but he was in that ministry because he was arrested by God. But there were some people that had a whole lot to say about what he was doing. And every now and then Paul had to remind himself that this thing is about the cross this thing is about Jesus and God's love would restrict just hold him back but there was one time he tried to get loose though it did it was in 2 Corinthians 12 and in 2 Corinthians 12 he wanted to get loose because he said I want to tell y'all uh -huh. I want you to I want to tell you that I, I got a ministry that God gave me and and this ministry God gave me is a unique ministry and I'm I'm really more qualified than all of y'all all of you uh, uh, fake apostles and false preachers that are trying to talk about me and I wish I could give you my resume but Paul said it would be arrogant for him to tell them about his resume so rather than tell them about his resume he said I knew a man Y'all not going to help me along in here. He was talking about himself. But he said, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But such a man, I'll boast in him. He said, but me, I won't boast in. But he was actually talking about his own ministry. Every now and then, you got to talk to folk in the third person. And let them know if I really let loose and I really tell you about me, you would find out you're nowhere near the level God has given me. But since I can't do that, because God gave me a thorn in my flesh that he keeps me from saying what I want to say. Not only will God tie you up, but he'll put a thorn in your flesh to keep you dependent on him. Thank you, guys. Now, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. He's, this thing, he, we're constricted by, by love. Watch the text. Thank you. We're restricted. By love. Watch the text. In verse 15. He died for all. So that they who live. 
might no longer live for themselves, that is. They who live can no longer live for themselves. I want you to read it, but read it and feel it. That you are not allowed or given permission to live self-centered. I don't know who in their right mind gets in ministry to be elevated. There's no glory in ministry. If it was up to me, I'd do something else. If it was up to me, who wants to deal with a plethora of personalities and half not under the guide of the Holy Spirit? That halfway listen to Jesus and you got to try to guide a church of people that have a variety of issues like you have and then have the audacity to want to be elevated in the Who gets in this to be unappreciated? Who gets in this to be the object of people's wrath because of what you preach? Who gets in this to have whole Facebook pages made about them? Who gets in this to, to, to be in a position where everybody could shoot a bullet and you can't shoot a bullet back? There, there's no glory in this. The only way to do this is to not live for yourself. That's the only way to do ministry. And so Paul says, those who are mischaracterizing me and those who are assassinating me, I gave up a whole lot for you to shoot at me. I was just fine as a rabbi in Judaism. I was elevated in Judaism. I had no equal in Judaism. I had the greatest mentor, Gamaliel. I was revered and highly exalted where I was. But I gave up all that. Philippians 3 says, I counted it as dung. Another fancy word for that is defecation. Uh, Y'all gonna help me along in here. I counted it as fertilizer. Everything I was, I gave up for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And you have the audacity to think I'm in this for me. So Paul says, hey, let me get verse 16 and I'm done. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one According to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Don't have time. The word flesh here really means human perspective. He's saying because we don't live for ourselves and because we have been converted He says, therefore, from now on, we don't recognize no one according to the flesh. That's human perspective. We don't judge people according to our human perspective. And he said, we even judge Christ that way, but no longer. In other words, God reshaped our thinking where we don't think from human perspective. Now, what's the principle? You can write it down. There will always be a what. Y'all help me get through this. There'll always be a what that you don't want to do. And it's at that moment where you got to revisit why. Y'all help me. Um, because sometimes you, you, You don't have it in you to keep pushing because you tired of doing the what because doing what 
is hard. And somebody, sometimes folk don't notice your grind and how much you pour out and how much you sacrifice and how much you give and how much of you you can't have in it and how much you give up for everyone else's well-being. And sometimes it gets hard to do what? And sometimes all you can do is look back at why. And hope that why is enough to keep you pushing down a path of doing uncomfortable what? And so I am, even before you struggling, because I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Because I push in the what when nobody was in this building. I pushed in a what when I had no amen crowd. I pushed in a what when we had an $85,000 note and all had was a word from God and the last thing I want is for somebody to ridicule my ministry as if it's been for me I pushed in this what because I always looked at why and it hurts when folk want to pretend like you're not an essential part of the equation and want to belittle what you've done and how you push, and how you grind, and how you sacrifice. And sometimes the what gets tiring. And all you do is look at why. And the problem is, sometimes you look at the why, like John the Baptist, and say, are you the one? Or should we look for another? It's that moment when you wonder, is it enough? When you are constantly under the pressure of being attacked and unsupported. And so you, you get tired of what? I push this thing. Pushed it. Cried. Sacrifice. And in the middle of pandemic, Praise God, we ended barely bringing 30,000 a week and jumped to 90,000. That's, that's what was happening in pandemic. Went from an in-person to 17,000 folk watching on a Sunday morning. Because I was grinding and trying to sacrifice and give a word and put my tears in it and put my energy in it, put all my power in it, put all my creativity in it so that this church could stand up under the weight of a pandemic, not knowing where we was going to survive or how we was going to survive other churches closing down all over the country. But I kept pushing to make sure that this church kept standing when nobody else could stand with me. Don't tell me about my ministry. Don't tell me that I did it for me. So what gets tiring? And I'm trying for you to keep doing what? Trying to do what? You unconsciously neglect your own family. Trying to make sure church is alright. You hardly home. Trying to make sure that everything is working well. Meeting with everybody. Trying to make sure it's all going to happen and work right. Sometimes you neglect your own health. Sometimes you neglect yourself until you lay it in a hospital. And I learned about some jokers. They'll kill you, bury you, and then put out an application for another preacher. Because sometimes you'll grind. 
and your sacrifice and acknowledged. So I'm tired. And I need a minute. I know I'm not all right. So I'm going to take a step back. Because I'm tired. And I'm unraveled. And I'm hurt. Because I put it in. I put it in. I put it in. Man, I put it in. Man, I put it in. I put it in. In a time when people could go to any church they want to press two buttons and they could be in another city. Them folks stayed at Renaissance. They had nothing to do with no program. They had nothing to do with no events. Nothing to do with that. Folk wanted teaching. That's what I gave them. So, you say what you want to say. I don't even care no more. You say what you want to say. You can talk about me. Say, oh, that's all right. Something happened to me tomorrow. This was on my shoulders. And ain't nobody got to admit that. And so I'm tired. And I'm not healthy. And I know I'm going to step back. And I'm all right with that. If I only could tell you the sacrifice I gave up. When you can't live for yourself. You don't know the half. If you're here, you want to be a child of God, you can do that. If you want to be baptized, you can. Jesus is what matters. At the end of the day, it's Jesus that matters. He's still Savior. When I'm coming apart, he doesn't. When I'm unraveled, he's not. He sits on the cross. I sit on on the throne and, and he's always together. I'm all right with being a human being. You can be washed in his blood and be constrained by the love of Christ, controlled, compelled.
just what he said he will do. He's going to fulfill. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Because he won't give up on you. He's able I hear you, demonic. I hear you, demonic. Oh, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church give God all the praise and all of the honor. What a feeling it is to this Sunday be a full circle Sunday. Um, this is an amazing, phenomenal moment where we acknowledge had it not been for the Lord, we would not be here today. And to go from an empty room to seeing this church back assembled is a reason to give God all the praise in all the honor. It's been a long journey. Um, it's been a long journey from 2020 um, to now. But it's, it's a, it is definitely um, a celebration moment to, to know everything that all of you have gone through. Um, from the commencement of this pandemic till now, I bet everybody in here has a story. And I think everybody in here has had some real challenges. But you're here. And the Lord has blessed us to still be renaissance. And for that, we're grateful to God for this moment. I want to, there's so many people to thank that I, I wouldn't even dream of trying to acknowledge everyone, except to say that um, there are some people who really put it in to make sure this church can stay afloat. And um, just a lot of sacrificing so that we could survive. And um, I begin with, at the very least, um, individuals that were here from day one, um, I want to thank God publicly for the vision team that works with me, that in the heart of the pandemic, they were meeting every week to try to figure out the protocols um, to assist this leadership to make sound and good choices. And I thank God for each and every one of you. Um, I, I, every one of them, every single one of them. And uh, one of those persons that led 
in that moment who I got to hug today was Sonia Tosin. And I just want you to know, I saw her this morning. I want you to know you are loved. If you raise your hand, I just want to, um, my heart uh, is, is full because every week we, we are, we, we really worked hard with the whole team. And I could name the whole team, but I want to point out that in the hardest moment, uh, she was, she was leading that team. And I want to say thank you to her and to so many others who were in that moment. The Keys, um, Tina Clark, just so many of them. Just, just thank God for every one of those individuals. And it's more LaDonna Darnell. Thank God for every last one of those individuals. Um, and if I'm forgetting a name, it's just it's just because my, my head, uh, charge that to my head, not my heart. Um, Rosalind Thomas was part of that. And just we just thank God for, for every one of them. Melissa Studemeyer and others were part of that team. Um, but I want to also thank... Um, Wesley Allen and the entire audiovisual team um, for <clears throat> for their great work and um, words cannot um, no adequate words for that team and what they've done um, just all of them and uh, I thank God for them um, I thank God for the whole Smith family Melvin Adenika for working really hard during a tough time. Um, I heard Melvin stand up here and he was one of the, the individuals that was here from the very beginning of pandemic and um, constantly. Uh, he was, him and Robert Wilson were the only amens I heard and uh, they, uh, they were really gracious and thank God for them as well. So many, many names. So if I didn't call you, it's not because you were not significant. Um, I do want to also mention Sister Tarantine and um, that team for, for feeding, uh, feeding us every Sunday. I mean, it wasn't like Chick-fil-A eating. It was like for real grits with cheese and pancakes and French toast and and just real stuff like real like the stuff that clogs every artery that's what we ate and it was good like it was good we are closer to death because of that good eating so we just thank God uh, for all of you and what that has meant um and just a host of other people, man. I could just just mention a host of other people. Um, just just everybody, you know. Um, thank God for the whole leadership and the grind that they put in. Um, that led to the to the drive-bys. Um, um, I've watched several of these men shed tears over people and we just thank God for the work you did. I want to thank God for every deacon in this place. I just love you so much. Um, you guys are stellar, man. You guys are stars. You really rock stars. I appreciate it. And um, I had a hard Sunday last week, so I know that's an elephant in the room. Um, and um, I got it out and I needed to get it out. Um, I am a, I'm a human being that has hurts like everybody. And, um, those were things that were sitting in my spirit for a long time. And, um, as I said last week, um, I know what I've put in for this church and I know how hard it was to try to not only carry the church here, but nationwide, the amount of people that were dependent on a word coming across a camera. Um, 
was, was difficult. I want to thank all of you for your encouragement from all across the country. I can't even um, begin to thank the amount of people um, that contacted me from every conceivable place. I knew it was bad when I got a call from West Africa. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a long way, man. And so we don't, I didn't realize, I know a lot of people watch our virtual, but the degree of people that are plugged into this church and resoundingly, it was just a great, great encouragement. So thank, and in this church, you know who you are. Um, so many people said, man, you know, where are you going to go? Um, where, where you, are, are you? Is, is the church mistreating you? I want to resound to the virtual world that this church loves their preacher. Um, and I know that. This church loves their preacher. And I don't want... Um, <laughs> y'all are a mess. <laughs> Uh, I thank God for you all. Uh, I do. So thank you. I, I, I didn't want anybody to get the wrong idea who are watching from abroad that my communication was about not being loved by the collective church. I so said that's not what that was. Um, I have hurts from particular places that I just let sit in my spirit. But I want you all to know I, I'm here. I'm here. And um, I thank God again for each of you. Now, let's go to work. Um, I, I, I want to share with you a text message I got this morning from my big sister who's here. She don't know I'm going to share this, um, but I am. And uh, Melissa texted me and said, um, now, listen, we got some meat on the grill. So don't you be up there all day. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what y'all clapping over there for. I mean, I don't know what that's about. But, um, but then she sent another text. She said, never mind. We worshiping up in here right now. The meat can wait. <laughs> and I just thank God for, for her. Um, turn your Bibles to Jonah while you're getting that. I knew I was going to be emotional in a lot of ways. And, uh, and right before I walked out, uh, Marion Clark came to the office and prayed with me. And um, he's a quiet storm. Um, and he probably one of those dudes that I just have real regular talk with. And uh, he came in. And, um, and right when I was about to walk out, he prayed with me. And um, I appreciate uh, our friendship and thank God for him. Uh, sometimes you need that person that uh, you, I don't have to be Dr. Hayward with him, just Orpheus. And um, he came and prayed a powerful prayer, as did Dan, Dan Sam. So I thank God for these men. Appreciate you. Here we go. Verse number one. I'm going to read sections of this text and let God speak to us. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I'd like you to underline from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Look at it, it says it a second time from the presence of the Lord. Reading the New American Standard, watch verse 4. 
Then the Lord hurled through or, or he sent a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down below into the hold of the ship, laid down and fallen sound asleep. I want you to now come to chapter two. Chapter two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. Watch it from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. And he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, when I look again toward your holy temple, water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars were around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit underlying pit oh lord my god now i want you to look at chapter 3 verse 1 chapter 3 verse 1 now the lord excuse me now the word of the lord came to jonah a second time is that in your bible all right now come up to jonah Chapter 1, I'm going to read one more verse. Don't want to skip this, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. I want to live for a subject when God's mercy is messy. When God's mercy is messy. May I throw out a provocative statement that I'd like to use to frame the conversation this morning in regards to this sermonic presentation. I don't know if there's any one of you that can be honest enough to admit that there are inevitably or there have been moments in your life when God's will is uncomfortable. Let me come a little closer to you. It is when God tells you to do something that your carnal self doesn't agree with. It is that moment when the reality is as spiritual as you are, and although you are a saved child of God, and although you are a Christian, you are a twice born kingdom member, and you go to church every Sunday, and I recognize that you are an avid student of the sacred text. But every now and then you read something you don't want to believe. Or you read something that's difficult for you to accept. That in my carnal man, in my flesh, that there is something to which I understand that the word of God is absolute truth. But at the same time, my carnal man wrestles with the absolute truth and find myself arguing against what God actually states. It is that inevitable moment when we don't want to admit that even Jesus struggled with the will of God to the degree that he had the audacity to say, let this cup pass from me. It is when even Jesus couldn't carry 
the will of God in a way where he didn't struggle with the thing that God was telling him to do. Isn't it interesting that even before the foundations of the world, Jesus was already quite aware, was part of the planning committee in regards to the scheme of redemption, knew that it was inclusive of his death. And at the moment when it was time to face the will of God, he said, I'm not too sure I want to do this. It's that moment when I want you not to be so Christian and so halo-ish and, and so uh, caught up in the strength of your Christianity that just for a moment in time that you can look at somebody in this auditorium and say, sometimes I struggle with what I read. That every now and then I find myself in a position where I am at a space where my carnality is fighting against the will of God because sometimes I'm struggling with the thing that God is telling me to do and sometimes I disagree and at times I want to retreat from God rather than stay with God. It's that moment when I can come to church and not be present. It's that... It's that moment when I can sing a song, but I'm singing it out of habit, not because I actually believe what I'm singing. It's that moment when I know how to hide in the crowd in such a way where I'm struggling to the degree that I really don't know if I'm walking right with God's will. I'm not too sure. I still want to do what God is asking me to do, but I'm too Christian to tell folk the truth of the matter about what I'm feeling. And that's the problem in the church is we got to hide what we feel. We got to hide our pain and we have to hide what's going on in our spirit every now and then you got to be honest enough to say God's will is a struggle for me and I'm trying to find my way through that and so in a moment of time there are those moments when you leave God and I'll explain what that means in a minute and God has to bring you back from a setback. And he'll bring you back sometimes through a messy mercy. Oh, help me preach this. I want to invite you into the spectrum of the Hebrew text of the book of Jonah. And I want you to understand that the book of Jonah was written. He was a northern uh, prophet. He was a northern kingdom prophet that probably was contemporary with the prophet Nahum. And both of them would have been individuals that prophesied somewhere between 800 B.C. and 704 or 612 B.C. before Nineveh actually was destroyed. Interestingly enough that some struggle with the historicity of the text because they find themselves unwilling to accept notions of a big fish swallowing an entire man and there are those who castigate the veracity of the text under the notion that it's probably mythological, I beg to differ. I believe when Jesus refers to Jonah, he refers to Jonah as a real historical figure and he mentions cities that actually were in existence to which whether or not you accept the miraculous that was happening in that day, the Bible is a historical document and there's more evidence for the historicity of Jonah than the notion that Jonah was some kind of mythological story. But instead of getting into all of that and diving into the archaeology, let me get into the meat of what's going on with Jonah. Jonah's been called by God to prophesy to Nineveh. Nineveh is a capital of the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh, throughout the tapestry of scripture, would be considered the enemy of Israel and was a power that was rising. And so Israel was already accustomed to hating this enemy that was an absolute tyrant. And so it is that God, in a moment in time, historically, before Nineveh would be, would be destroyed, God wanted to give Nineveh the opportunity to turn to him. The problem is, is that Nineveh are pagans. They are not part of the constituency of Judaism. They are not Jews. They are the pagan people. They are a world empire that's functioned as the enemy of Israel. Yet God tells Jonah, I am calling you to go preach to folk who are traditionally your enemies that you do not believe for one moment have any right to be in covenant relationship with me. Yet I am calling you to go preach to folk that you hate. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, God said, go to Nineveh. And I want you to go preach to them. And I want them to give them an opportunity for repentance. 
I want you to show them my compassion. And Jonah turned and said, I'm not going. Why are you not going, Jonah? Because God, I refuse to watch you show compassion to people who are not of our nation. And then to add insult to injury, they have historically been our enemy. And here's why Jonah didn't want to do it. Jonah said, the reason I don't want to do it, God, is because I know they'll repent. Missed it. The reason he doesn't want, (laughs) the reason he doesn't want to see it happen is not so much the preaching that he's concerned with. He's concerned with they're actually going to change. And because he is convicted and knows that the word of God is powerful enough to make these Ninevites turn to God, the the issue with Jonah is, I don't want to preach to them because I know if I do the right thing and preach to them, they're going to end up changing and being better and being in covenant relationship with you. And I don't want to do that, God, because if I do this, it just might actually work. So Jonah decides, I can't do that because God, I don't want them to experience your compassion or your transformative power. I would prefer at this point to go in a completely different direction. And in Jonah chapter one, the Bible says, Jonah went to Tarshish. Get this now. The text is interesting because it continuously uses the word. Let me read it to you. Look at your Bibles. It continuously uses the term He went down. Now that's a geographical statement, but it's interesting that that's the language of the text. Look at the Bible. Uh, But God says in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it with uh into uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord isn't it interesting that whenever you leave God there's some kind of relationship with leaving God and going down I wish I had time to deal with that uh there's a geographical uh wording but it's interesting that there is a down now that's geographical in nature but I think there's a relationship between the notion that a person leaves God and goes down now the text challenges me because it says that Jonah went down from the presence of God. Last time I checked, God is everywhere. How can you leave? What does it even mean to leave God's presence? Last time I checked, where the Bible says in Psalms, where can I go from your spirit? If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I ascend into the uttermost parts of heaven, there you are. In other words, you cannot leave God's physical presence. However, whenever you leave God's assignment, it is equivalent to leaving God's presence. Y'all are missing this. When it, leaving the presence of the God of God is when Jonah made a decision to leave God's purpose for what he was called to do. So now he leaves the presence of the Lord because he left the assignment God gave because he did not want to see this uncomfortable reality of the fact that these Ninevites just might repent. So, so, so he leaves, I wish that two or three people, whenever God's will is uncomfortable, you don't leave his physical presence, but some of you know something about leaving his assignment. Don't just, right now you're thinking about me and preaching. I'm talking about the assignment God put in your life. I'm talking about the assignment God calls you to as a child of God, where he wants you to work in a certain particular purpose. And there are moments when it is uncomfortable, the thing that God is asking. It's uncomfortable for me to do the will of God when he's asking me to love an enemy. I don't have no help up in here. It's uncomfortable when God is asking me to do something that I have to be tolerant with the intolerable. It is that moment where God is calling me to be patient when I don't want to be patient. It is that moment that God is telling me to wait and I don't want to wait. It's that moment when God asks me to walk in the uncomfortable and rather than go to Nineveh, I decide to turn to Tarsus. Because I don't want... To do the thing that God 
is calling me to do because of the uncomfortable nature of the thing that he asked. Now watch your text. Watch your text. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 is a killer. He says, the Lord hurled through a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship that Jonah was on started to break up. Let me tell you, we always talk about storms, but has God ever thrown one at you? I know we want to think that the devil's responsible for every storm that you go through. I know you want to be victimized and sometimes we want people to pray for us as if we're the victim. But in the quiet of your own home, there are times when you know that God actually threw a storm at you and everything that you're in is starting to break apart. Have you ever tried to run from God and when you tried to find refuge, he started breaking up the geographical place you were in? Have you ever had a moment when God just won't let it go? Have you ever just wanted God to let it go? Let me be. And God says, I love you too much to let you run from me. I'll send a storm that's not designed to hurt you, but it'll break up everything that you're trying to trust in because God is loyal to bringing you back to your assignment. So God throws it. I mean, just some, the word hurl. He, God is like a baseball pitcher. So are you running? And threw a stall. And here's Jonah on the ship. Watch this. Oh, watch this. Watch this. With pagans. Come here. Come here. Come here. He didn't want to go preach to pagans. But when he ran, ran from God, he got on a ship with pagans. Stay with me. You on a ship with folk that you don't even think is worth God. You running from an assignment and then running into your assignment. <laughs> Y'all not there. <laughs> You're running from an assignment. To only run into your assignment and the ship is getting broken up. Everything is coming apart. And this dude went down into the lower part, laid down in absolute depression, and went to sleep. Have you ever tried to sleep it away? I wish I had one or two witnesses. Have you ever been that person that didn't even want to get up out to bed because you don't want to face the next day because you refuse to do the thing that God has assigned you to do? And sometimes when I don't agree with God, I'd rather run from him and I'd rather sleep away the discomfort. Meanwhile, everybody on the ship is affected. So, so everybody on the ship is affected. I love this part because then everybody starts praying. The Bible says, I'm not going to read all of it. They start praying to their God. So all the pagans that he don't like are praying to God while he's sleeping and their God ain't answering. So then they start sending stuff overboard because the ship is breaking up. And they don't know what's going on. And they have no clue about what's happening. And they start overturning the stuff to try to lighten the ship. Boy, do you know when you don't know what your storm is about, you'll start throwing stuff overboard that wasn't meant to go overboard. And man, you trying to blame everything else except the thing that's really going on because you don't really understand what the storm is really about. And so it is that as Jonah is sleeping, they're crying to their God. As they cry to their God. Then they said, no, our gods ain't answering. Hey, I don't know where they're at. But they, these are, by the way, Tarshish is a Phoenician trade route. And Tarshish leads out into the deep. And he's with these pagans, more than likely these Phoenicians. And they crying to their gods and ain't nobody answering. They said, well, I tell you what, there's got to be a problem somewhere. 
because we fit to die. So they cast, no, no, they go to Jonah. They said, Jonah, do you have a God you could pray to? <laughs> Y'all are missing this. He don't want to go to Nineveh because he doesn't want God to save Ninevites. He don't want them to learn about the one God, Yahweh, that has complaints, passion. But here it is while he's running from his assignment. They are now in a situation where their gods won't answer. So they go to the only other person on the boat and they say, Jonah, do you have somebody that we can cry to? So now they start, Jonah, what's going on here? What's happening? Jonah says, oh, well, I'm going to let you read it. I'm going to let you read it. Let me let you read it. Let me read it. Get your Bibles. Get, get your Bibles. I want you to come down to verse number eight. They said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? They trying to figure out, look, we all praying to our gods. Who are you? What God do you have? Here's what he said. I am a Hebrew. Watch this. Now this is the God he's running from. Look at what he says. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, Yahweh, who made the sea and the dry land. Y'all not getting this thing. The God he's running from, he's still preaching. Y'all, the, the God that he doesn't want to be associated with, he's still preaching that God. The God that he's trying to run from. He's still saying, I am a Hebrew. I am the one who fears. What do you mean you fear God? I thought you was running from God. Yet he's still saying in the midst of, you know what? There's something about when God is in you that you can't help for God to come out of you. Even when you ain't doing everything you should be doing. When there's God inside of you, sometimes you're going to speak God, whether you live in God or not live in God. Because when you are a child of God, God will put something in your spirit that whenever you're around folk that need to know something about God, there's something that stirs up in your spirit that even though me and God are not in the right place, I still want to let you know that there's only one God. There's only one Yahweh. And here he is. He's still talking about the God he's running from. He is now running from preaching, but preaching. I'm not trying to relate this to me, but God probably is. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to actually preach to you, but I don't know how this is working out right now. Um, let me relate one thing to you that happened to me this week when I was in absolute frustration. I went to the mall to walk around and make fun of people. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I sat on the massage chair in the mall and, you know, didn't care about COVID or anything, just touching everything. Um, <laughs> And sat there and I was watching people walk by and I was just in the space and um, this this I get up to walk away and then this guy and this young lady grabbed me and they say hey we just moved here from Lawrence uh, from from wherever they were military and they said man we wanted to know what are some things we can do in Lawrenceville I said man I don't know I don't do nothing I don't really hang out like that you're asking the wrong person where do I go um, so they said, well, you know, we just wanted to know, man, because just, we just knew, wanted to get to know you. What's your name? And I said, well, my name is uh, Orpheus Hayward. And I said, man, it's great to meet you. I said, I wish I could be more helpful, but I can't. And uh, I said, I'm sorry about that. He said, well, that's cool, man. You know, I just, uh, we're part of a, a, a Christian group that we do study, man. We'd love to invite you. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, that's, I said, uh, well, wonderful. I said, uh, what, what is your group called? And he told me what the group was called. And he said, you know, we believe in going by the Bible and the Bible only. We, we are according to the scriptures. And I said, ah, oh, that's great. I said, that's wonderful. I said, man, well, listen, I, I don't know. I'd be happy to come join your group and sit in and, and talk with you. He says, yeah, because, um, you know, really God is the one who made the heavens and the earth. And we want you to know more about that God. And he said, um, um, and uh, I said, okay. I didn't tell him who I was at this point. Like, um, yeah, I said, man, that's great. I appreciate you so much. And I said, man, what else do you know about him? And so he says, well, 
you know, he, he, he uh, sent his son Jesus. I said, man, that's good. All of that's really great, man. I said, well, um, I said, man, something made you stop me. I don't know what that is. But, man, do you, are you trying to start a ministry or something? Because, like, you know, you just stopped me out of blue. Do you have another? I said, you started out talking about your new, and now you're kind of, like, trying to convert me to something. What's the something you're trying to do? He said, well, no, I just want you to know that um, I'm not trying to start a ministry. I'm kind of part of a ministry. I said, well, great, man. But I said, you, you know, like, it's been 30 minutes and we're still here. So I'm trying to figure out you know, where we going? Like you, thank you for the information, but it's something else. He said, I just want you to know your Bible's true. And I want you to know your Bible's real and you got to read it right. Cause that Trinity stuff, you know, I don't believe in that. I, Jesus is not God. And I was like, now, now, now y'all know I'm on the boat headed to Tarshish. And I ain't trying to get into no beef. Yeah? But he says, you know, because Jesus is not God. He's the son of God. And th these people who teach that there's one God and three persons, there's no such thing as that. There's only Jehovah God and there's one God. And the Bible says he's the son of God. I said, listen, man. Um, I, uh, I'm really not. I hear you. But I'm going to go down to... Uh, to uh, the guest store because I want to buy he says well do you understand what I'm saying and I walked I, I was trying to walk away and he kept following with the girl and I said well I said um listen man um what what are you trying to tell me now something else right I said are you trying to tell me Jesus is not God are you trying to tell me that the Jesus of the Bible is just a human being called the son of God? Is that what you're telling me? I said, well, you pick the right one today. I want you to go and get to your Bible. I want you to go to John chapter 1. And I want you to meet me in verse 18. Because in verse 18, it says, no man has seen God at any time except the only begotten God. He is the true God. And while I'm on that, go to John 1.1, 1, 1, where the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And while I'm on that, what? Why don't you turn your Bible, since you with him, get your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Unto us a child is born, and a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. And then, while they looking at me, they looking at me now like... Oh. I said, no, 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 you picked the right one now. Now get your Bible. They said, well, we're not here. We're trying to help you see the truth. I said, I'm trying to help you see the truth. You know, I said, so while you're on that, since you're really not trying to learn the truth, you got an English translation. Why don't you get the new, the Nestle Allen 27 in the Greek New Testament? Since your organization doesn't understand how to translate from the original languages, let me read it to you in the original. And I'm going, and now they, they said, listen, this conversation is over. I said, no, I still want to talk. I still got time. Where you going? Why are you walking away? I still. I'm on my way to Tarsus. And you had the audacity to stop me. And now you don't want to talk no more. Why are they walking away? I'm following them. I'm saying, listen, when you find that verse, I'll be over at the guest store trying to buy some clothes. Meet me there when you find that passage. When God is in you, it doesn't matter where you go. There's something about God that'll come out. And so... And so if you're Jonah, God will let you run from him, watch it, and run into your assignment. Watch this. Let me finish this up because we got some meat on the grill. <laughs> Listen, um, Jonah is with these men and finally they cast lots. They said, because if we ain't the problem, and if that, our gods are not answering somebody the problem, they cast lots. And a lot fell on the dude that was trying to sleep. And man, when that thing fell, Jonah said, I tell you what you do. 
you got to throw me overboard. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to kill me. Because the problem is I'm running from an assignment. Watch this. After they got ready to throw him overboard, the Bible says they started praying to Yahweh. Jonah converted who he didn't even want to convert. What he ran from is what he's doing. What are you running from in your own life? And God has hurled a storm. I'm trying to help you. He praise God, even if I can't help myself. <laughs> I'm trying to help you understand that God will hurl a wind and, and you are now so bad. Watch this now. I want you to see how stubborn Jonah is. He didn't say turn the boat around and take me back. Just kill me. You know what kind of space you got to be in to be so against what God said that you'll kill yourself. They throw him over. Now, here's where I want to go against all of your Sunday school lessons. I saw a picture of a Sunday school lesson about Jonah where the fish's mouth is open. Y'all seen that? And when he jumps, he jumps it into the fish's. Hey, what happened? Hey, what happened? He jumped into the sea and was drowning. And was about to die. But the book says God appointed a big fish. Watch this. Since I got somebody running from assignment, he called the fish to an assignment. And said, go get him. Because he actually thinks I'm going to let him die. swallowed him. Now, I don't want to argue about what kind of fish it was. I don't care. You know, was it a whale? Was it a... Man, I don't know. Um, but if God can make bread come out of heaven and he could form man out of the dust of the ground, I'm not too sure he got a problem making a great fish. That means this. Let me close it out. That means the fish wasn't his punishment. It was his mercy. Sometimes God's mercy is messy and uncomfortable. And Jonah had to sit in fish guts for three days. Can you imagine? For three days. He's in fish guts. Watch this. But when you realize where you were, fish guts ain't so bad. And he sits in fish guts in a nasty space. And he's trying to get it together and he starts praying to God. Watch this. He says, thank you, God, for saving me from the pit. Keep it in your mind. Thank you, God, for saving me from being buried. Thank you, God, for saving me from drowning and putting me in these fish guts where I now sit in a salvation that's uncomfortable.
Because God, sometimes I got to thank you even for messy mercy. It's when it's uncomfortable, but it's mercy. It doesn't fit, but it's a mercy. And he sat there for three days and three nights. Now, the fish throws him up on the third day. Because he's been buried for three days. And it's messy. It don't look right. It looks like it's the end. But on day three, the fish regurgitates him. And, and, and Jonah has a resurrection after three days of being buried in a fish's belly. I think I read in Matthew 12, Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so must the son of man be in the grave for three days and three nights. It looked messy when they beat him till his flesh hung open. Look messy when they put nails in the soft flesh of his hands. Look messy when they put him in the grave and buried him. But I'm glad God made the grave throw up and put Jesus out so that he could rise from the dead. And Jesus saved us by a messy mercy. I need somebody to be all right with when God's mercy was messy. I need you to thank God that it ain't always been feeling good, but I thank God you saved me and you put me in fish guts. I'm glad, God, that this might not have been the way I chose it, but thank you for saving me with a messy mercy. Now look at chapter three, verse one. We're done, watch this. About to go get Melissa's stuff. Get that meat off that grill. Let's go. Now, look at chapter three, verse, chapter three, verse one. And I'm gonna end on a sad note, and I'm really sorry, because I didn't have another way to end it. But it's a good note, it's a good note. Verse one is where you should shout, right here. This is. If you have any Pentecostalism in you, this is where it happens. And you'll catch it. Now, think about where he's been in fish guts. A storm that broke a boat up. A, a moment when God hurled the wind at him. The fish threw him up after three days. In verse one, right here is where you shout. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I'm glad God will give me a second time. I'm glad God after messy mercy will say now let's try this again if I had a word for renaissance it would be there's been some mess in this church we've gone through a lot in this church God has blessed us in this church but somebody ought to say God has given us a second chance and God is saying let's do this again God is saying now that you've reimagined Let's do it again. Now for the low point. Look at chapter four. Here's the low point. We might, we might not shout on this, or you might, I don't know. I gotta stop predicting. He preached to the Ninevites. Guess what it did? It worked. It worked. They, they repented. At the preaching of Jonah. Jesus said Nineveh, Nineveh is going to rise up and judge this generation. Because as evil as they were. They repented. Jonah knew that they would. Jo Jonah said that's why I want to preach to them. Because I know they're going to change. I am a Jew. And I think only Jews. Should be in right relationship with God. I don't like them God. I was real grateful that you made them an enemy. And now you're talking about showing them compassion. Jonah said, I'm not for it. Jonah ends up in the belly of the fish. Three days later, God says, I'm going to talk to you a second time. Now watch chapter four. After all of the stuff that happened, 
but it greatly displeased Jonah. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to foretell this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew <laughs> my problem is that I knew you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O oh Lord, watch this. Please take my life from me. You could have let me die in the water because I knew this was going to happen. Don't have time to show what God does here. God said, the Lord said, do you have a reason to be angry? I don't ever want to argue with God because it's not fair. I know you mad. But do you have a reason? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. Then he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in it, uh, sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant. This is the second appointment God did. First it was a fish, now it was a plant. And it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. Mm. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God then appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant and the plant was gone. God said, I've appointed a fish. I've appointed a plant to shave you. But because I want to teach you something, I'm going to let the worm eat up the plant. Now you ain't got no shade. Watch that. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. Look at all these appointments. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have a good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, look at, look at God, he's not fair. You had compassion on the plant. You got mad because the plant got ate up for which you did not work, for which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Are you mean to tell me that you can have all that compassion on a plant, but I can't have compassion on people? You didn't cause it. You didn't plant it. I provided that plant. And if I'm the one that provided the plant, I can do what I want with the plants I plant. In other words, God's saying, everybody on this earth belongs to me. And if I want to show compassion to the Ninevites, then I'll show compassion to whom God wants to show compassion. God is saying, you can't question me. Be angry, but do my will. Oh, be angry, but obey my voice. Be angry, but like Peter, say, nevertheless, not my will. And I will be done. If you're here, God threw a wind. Okay. It didn't touch you. God threw COVID. He threw it at the church. He threw it at the world. I let you experience a setback for a comeback but the question is did you learn anything in the setback yeah. 
Jonah had a setback and a comeback, but his mind was the same. God through COVID, and God is saying, church, what did you learn? Did you come back to church with the same mind that you had in 19? Are you still as messy? Is your attitude still ugly? Are you still a chief complainer? Are you still underhanded? Do you still bring more hell than peace? What did you learn in the setback? What did you learn in fish guts? Y'all not... You, you, what did you learn when you sat in intestines? What? What did you learn? What did you learn about you in COVID? Did you pray more? Did you read the Bible more? Did you let me get in your spirit and in your context so that you bring light to dark places? Or are you still as dark as you were before COVID? I think today, I'm, you know, I, I want you to get the word, but I'm, I'm, uh, can I admit to you that I am, I believe I'm a good teacher. But I'm not always good at applying what I teach. I'm sorry if that's too honest. I want to apologize if that was offensive. And I can admit that sometimes I want you to learn what I still don't want to accept. And that's why you got to pray for your man of God. Your because, hold on, because I'm just as frail as you. You know? So as I'm up here preaching, as God would have it in his humor, I really came to preach to you. But he always wants to talk to me. And so I say to you, even in my own struggle to apply, um, fish guts is, is mercy, not punishment. And I need you to think about your own life. And, and ask yourself, and I, I mean, I know, what the, I know what God did with the church. I mean, with the church, God kicked us out because we weren't being a body. We were just doing church. I believe God had to refocus the church by attempting to eliminate superficiality. And I don't know if we got it or not. Not sure. But I think one thing COVID should have probably, the storm that hurled at us should have taught is to value people. Like I feel like it was supposed to teach that. I feel like it was supposed to teach you and me to value that you never know what somebody else's struggle is. And to be a shoulder for people that are in real pain. I think COVID taught us when God hurled that wind, 
he was showing us that we were doing church but not expanding kingdom. So God had to get us out the church building to realize how evangelism really happened. I don't know if we learned it or yet, but I know that's what he was teaching. God was trying to teach the church, start, stop arguing over the stuff that don't matter. There's some things that have nothing to do with doctrine. It has everything to do with your preference. And COVID showed that. You couldn't even argue about coming back to evening service. I wish I had two or three people. Like that wasn't even a fight no more. Well, it wasn't a fight for us. But I mean, for the churches of Christ, we still argued over that. We couldn't even argue. You could no longer abuse Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembly. Like God cleaned up our theology with a virus. You missed what I just said. God cleaned up our theology with a virus. He's trying to get to church, man. Rethink that. Rethink that. Rethink that. Rethink that. We probably would have never thought to have women involved in our singing at all had COVID not happened. COVID happened and folk cried out about how bad the singing was. Y'all was like, all right, anything will help. So, so as long as y'all weren't in the building, y'all were good with the women on the mic. As long as, we're, uh, as long as we're not in the building at the time, some things just didn't matter anymore, man. What mattered was people. So let's do this as we close. Let's do this. Let's do this. It's comeback day. Let's, um, I want you to think about your fish guts experience with God and I want you to take this moment to say it's time for me to heal from the pain that I experienced and allow God to help you appreciate messy mercy I want to thank God for messy mercy Thank you for the setback so that I could have a comeback. And I believe God's going to bless us. Stand with me. If you want to be saved, you want to be baptized for the remission of your sins, today's your day to experience salvation. I want you to come up front and say, it's my day to be saved. Or you're that person that says, I want prayer because I've experienced messy mercy. And I want to come forward to reflect, to think through all that God has brought me through. This is going to be a prayer of reflection. This is a prayer to say, God, thank you for fish guts. Thank you for that moment when you helped me to see me. Thank you, God. For allowing me to experience full circle. In other words, God had an empty building here and now God's put us back full circle. Are you thanking him for the messy mercy that you had to go through and experience? Meet me up front if you want to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. God, thank you for my messy mercy. Messy mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you, come on. God bless you, come on. If this is your day to say, God, I'm giving all my pain to you. I'm giving all my pain to you. I'm giving, I, I'm, I'm, God, I'm, I'm ready to do your will. It's uncomfortable, but I'm, but God, help me to appreciate messy mercy. Messy mercy, messy mercy, messy mercy, messy mercy. Messy mercy. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 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 
Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Praise him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. 